So today I'm at Double Negative VFX House in uh, London, um, a VFX studio that have worked on some massive Hollywood titles, things like Iron Man and Interstellar and many, many others. And I'm here with Simon Kay, who is the motion capture supervisor here at Double Negative. And uh, I've been working with Simon for 13 years. Believe it or not, he was present at my very, very first motion capture shoot in Cheltenham, right? Well, that was many years ago, yeah. Indeed, 2002, yeah. was it? I think it Something was, like yeah, that, yeah. 2001 or two, yeah. Um, and now Simon's working here as the motion capture supervisor. So tell us a bit about your role here. Um, so I look after all things motion capture here, really. Uh, the in-house system that we have here, uh, any external shoots, uh, any on-set stuff, anything like that, and also looking after the pipeline. Um, how we get the data in, how it goes to the animators. Right, okay. Um, so let's talk about how, uh, how we work, we, how, how you incorporate motion capture into your pipeline. So for instance, from a performer perspective, um, take a project like Iron Man 2 that we, that we worked on some years yeah. ago, uh, we were doing digital doubling. So yeah. explain a bit more about that. So we have sort of two kinds of digi doubles. There's one which are the principal characters, mm -hmm. like Iron Man, and there's also um, crowd work. Mm -hmm. And depending on which one we're doing, varies slightly. But the main focus is getting your performance mm -hmm. uh, onto a digital version of the character. Right. So, like for instance, in in Iron Man Two, it's the Iron Man, Robert Downey Jr.'s version of Iron Man. You're mm. you're trying to double that for shots they couldn't do on set. Um, yeah, some of it's sort of the impossible shots that you, you can't do, like right. Iron Man's flying, obviously, uh -huh. and things like that. Some of them are changes, creative changes that come along as the movie progresses. I see, right. So if they change it, make, it, make a change to the story or the plot or any of the shots, that's where you'd step in and cover them for that. Yeah. Right. Uh, and also to bring life for Iron Man where he's wearing a big suit, mm -hmm. you, you, you've got to sort of recreate that. So it's taking like your performance uh, and making it as though you're wearing the suit or uh -huh. amping it up that little bit more, sort right. of taking it to a sort of slightly more comic book extreme version right. of it. So when an actor steps into the studio and they're doing digital doubling, often because of secrecy rules, you don't know what you're doing until you arrive, right? That's sometimes the way it is. Yeah. So you'll show the actor some reference footage uh, so they can get into the movement style, what kind of, whether they're wearing a suit, what kind of shape it is. Yeah, I mean, we find the more reference we can give to an actor, uh -huh. Obviously, the better for them because yeah. a lot of the time you're in a wide open studio and a micro yeah. suit, it's nothing like where it's going to be used in the end. So, we try to bring as much information as we can to actors. Um, any sort of concept sketches, clips from the movie, right. uh, previs, sort of anything that can help you bring that character to uh -huh. life. Because, obviously, the better job you do, the less work hopefully we have uh, to do sure. as well. So, yeah, it's all about giving you as, as, as actors as much information as we can. I see. And so, would you say that? Uh, for digital doubling, mimicry is a good skill for an actor to have, being able to read body language and be able to kind of recreate that. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's sort of two sides to it with that. It's One is obviously the performance side mm -hmm. and being able to create that performance in the body mm -hmm. because you don't have face. Yeah. Um, and being able to convey those sort of emotions that the character is going through just through your body. Right. Uh, and also being able to mimic what somebody's doing because we might show you a shot and yeah. say, we want you to do exactly the same as what this character is doing. Uh -huh. Uh, and having that body control to quickly sort of mirror what they're doing. Now, right. Is it the left hand that's down or the right hand that's uh -huh. down? And how do they move and quickly sort of pick it up on that? So okay. we find dancers, people with martial arts experience and, right. and mime and things like that that have good body control. Yeah. That really helps with, um, not essential, but it, it does help with when you're doing mm -hmm. shots like that. So it's a mix of uh, kind of physical ability, people who've done body coordinated activities like gymnastics, mm. martial arts, mixed with a good performance level because it's not just combat or whatever, it's also a character they're playing. Yeah, I mean, even for obviously for principal characters, then, you know, the performance is, is, yeah. is everything. But even for the background characters, when we're doing crowds and things like that, right, they might okay. think, well be far off in the background, but you're still uh -huh. in a situation yep. reacting to something that's happening around you. And if you, if that doesn't look weird, if you've got some guy that does something slightly different, then uh -huh. yeah, it, it's going to stand out in a, in a well, crowd Well, if you took an old, sort of, say, take a movie and they have bad extras in it, everybody can see the idiot in the background who's exactly. not doing it right. Yeah. And the same applies to motion capture, right? Yeah, I mean, we're doing, we're creating the digital version of that extra. So yeah. if the digital version is bad, then he will stand out as much right, as okay. the the live action version as well. So let's say, a film like Total Recall, you've got a bunch of crowd scenes, um, and I think there was one where there was a craft coming in and people are running out the way and things yeah. like that. You're going to create, say, 50 or 100 different characters on screen, 
and how many actors will you use to create that number of characters? Uh, we generally shoot with sort of two, uh, two male and two female, so usually right. four people, um, and we give them a sort of a scene, a motivation of uh -huh. this is what's happening in the scene, and then we get each person to do a slight variation on that. Right. Um, so they're all doing the same type of action, mm -hmm. just in slightly different sort of ways. And you'll shoot that repeatedly with constant variation so that you can mass produce that shot. Because they may only be in it for five or six seconds, or maybe 15 seconds. Yeah. But if you've got enough material, I'm assuming you can just duplicate it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there becomes a point, obviously, there's only so many ways you can be scared or uh -huh. yeah. react to an explosion going off. Sure. But the slight changes in physicality mm -hmm. between people and things like that, and whether they react fast or slow, you can build that mm -hmm. up, and then we do other tricks like offsetting the timings and things like right. that. Yeah, okay. So there's a few little magic touches that we add to it cool. to sort of hide it as well. But yeah, definitely the having each person do it slightly differently as well, mm -hmm. or be a, either by a character that mm -hmm. we give them to do, um, or the the actual situation that they're in, whether they turn around and see the explosion, mm -hmm. or whether they're looking at the explosion when it goes off. So again, mm -hmm. it's that giving you as much information as you can have to do the scene that we want you to get. So finally then, if you were going to give a bit of advice for an actor who has found themselves uh, getting the job on a digital doubling shoot or a crowd shoot, what should they be thinking about when they come to the studio? Is there anything they should have in their head? Um, I think if you can find out what, what you might be doing, that's uh -huh. always handy. Okay. Um, I think as well, good a good improvisation and knowing what questions to ask. Right. Because um, some of the time with films, obviously people are a bit more used to working with actors, but sometimes in games they're not always yeah. used to working with. So um, knowing what questions to ask, because mm -hmm. they might just say to you, we want you to do a walk. Mm -hmm. And then when you do it wrong, they'll just say, make it faster. So they yep. won't give you that sort of Classic, guidance yeah, that you absolutely. might need. So being able to figure out what questions you can ask somebody mm -hmm. to get the information you need yeah. to do the... The acting, so you need the to know you where need. you are, what it looks like, what kind of environment it is, what's been happening before, what happens after, uh -huh. but yeah. not too many questions that you drive the animator insane. I imagine. Yeah, it's, hopefully they'll give you enough information and you'll be able to pick up stuff mm -hmm. from the, the previews and things that they can show you, um, that you can build some of that. But yeah, just figuring out, you know, if I'm coming, if, what your stage directions mm -hmm. are, or any business that you need to do at certain marks to hit mm -hmm. and things like that. Hopefully that will be laid out. Sometimes it's uh -huh. not. So yeah, knowing, sort of gauging how to ask that and get the things you're doing, like you say, without uh -huh. repeating the questions and annoying people. So. Right. That's great. Thank you. So uh, Simon and I worked on something recently, which is uh, we can't Quite talk about moment. yet, but do stay tuned because that's going to be big news. Um, so this has been Simon K at Double Negative. Thank you for watching.